All right, hello everyone. My name is Dr. Joel Rosen. I am the Adrenal Fatigue Recovery Ninja, and I want to welcome you back to another edition of your Adrenal Fix. So today I wanted to talk to you, I wanted to continue the conversation of adrenal fatigue and the role um, that um, thyroid mechanisms or thyroid mechanics or altered thyroid mechanics or hypothyroidism um, has to do with adrenal fatigue. So um, let's just talk about some of the symptoms and signs. So someone who has an adrenal problem doesn't handle stress very well, they, they get anxious, they, their blood sugar is not stable, they get shaky, lightheaded and jittery if they miss a meal, um, they, they get energized when they have a meal, uh, they, um, they crave sugars or they crave salts and uh, they don't handle stress the way that they used to. Um, potentially they have difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep. They wake up in the morning, they're exhausted, they crash in the middle of the day, and um, they're not doing a good job. Thyroid's very, very similar in terms of hypothyroid symptoms. They have brain fog, um, they don't focus, they can't concentrate, um, they're cold all the time, they're not able to lose any weight, um, their metabolism is slowed down, their gastrointestinal symptoms aren't, not, aren't doing so well. So there's a lot of overlap between those, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Um, the first thing I did want to talk to you about was I want to give credit where credit is due, and really it comes down to um, Dr. Datis Karazian. And he is the author of the, the thyroid, it's called Mastering the Thyroid. And um, you've probably heard his book before, it's called Why Do I Have Thyroid Symptoms Even Though My Blood Tests Aren't Normal. And um, one of the things that uh, I wanted to say was, I've been to the seminar a couple times and every time I go, it's like I haven't been before because I'll hear things that I, that I don't remember them teaching. And yes, they do update their teachings, but you know how they say when the, um, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. You, you won't hear things and then you hear things and I thought, I gotta share it with you guys. And that's really what I, where, where I came up with these bullet points. And so, um, you know, we get so mad at the traditionally trained trained medical doctor saying, oh, they're not looking at thyroid the way that we should, uh, that the way that, we, that the, the way that they should in terms of they're not looking at all the mechanics. They're not looking at um, what's going on with the hypothalamus and the pituitary. They're not looking at what's going on at the production side of things because they only look at T4. They're not looking at what's going on at the processing side of things because the liver and the gut really convert 80% of the inactive hormone. And if there's a liver problem or there's a methylation problem or there's a gut problem um, then they're not looking at that and then they're not looking at what's going on at the proteomic level which basically means once it's been produced once it's been um, processed then it has to be able to get inside the cell and they're not looking at that either and and we get frustrated it's like my doctor's only you know looking at my synthroid and he's only looking at my TSH and if I'm lucky my T4 but nothing else and he never does antibodies or she never does antibodies and they never retest them and and we think they don't know anything and and so um, my first bullet point was why most doctors know exactly what is going wrong with the thyroid, but they choose to take the easy way out. And, and the reason why I think that is, is because it's too complicated. It really is. There's so many things that, that you have to delve into. You have to delve into neurotransmitters, serotonin and dopamine and how that impacts your hypothalamus. You have to look at blood sugar imbalances. You have to look at other stressors in the body. You have to look at um, if there's heavy metals or organophosphates or there's radiation. You have to look at the liver if there's major infections, immune, um, immune um, exposures, pathogens, toxins, chemicals. Um, you have to look at gut issues, microbiome stuff, uh, you know, all that type of stuff. And then you have to look at methylation. And, and they know exactly that you have to do that. But guess what? It's an insurance-based model. And it's a, um, a pharmaceut pharmaceutically driven model. And I've said this many times where it's the year 2018. And, and you know, they get paid less for a Medicare ver visit that they do, you know, in 2002 than they do now. And, and, and blood, you know, and, and staff and overhead and everything else has gone up. Um, but reimbursements have gone down. So I would ask the question, do these doctors have more time to spend with you or less time with, to spend with you? They have less time to spend with you. So what they're going to do is they're going to look at things from a very rudimentary way and say, well, TSH is really what the pituitary um, is communicating to the thyroid and there's a feedback loop. And T4 is what tells the pituitary what's going on with the thyroid. And if T4 is 
you know, is low and TSH is high, then then th that's where we look at the thyroid problem. And if um, and and if we want, and most of the time it's within normal ranges, but let's just give a little bit of Synthroid or let's give some Armor, and if you're lucky, compounded T4, T5, you know, T3, Cytomel or something else, or Westroid is what it's called now. But they're not looking at the whole mechanism, and and really 90% of having a low thyroid um, is is going to be an autoimmune phenomena. And if you have antibodies, then the medical model is well, you have antibodies. There's nothing we can do about it. Take T4 and you know, go home and stop being a difficult patient. I mean, really, that's what that's what the model is, and um, it's a sad, sad state of affairs. But it really is you know, what's, what's been going on in today's healthcare. Um, so how does the stress response impact both thyroid and adrenals? So, so the other mechanisms that I wanna talk about is the pituitary um, is really responsible for coordinating endocrine and as well as the hypothalamus um, endocrine resp responses. So when we're stressed out, um, the, the pituitary um, is sending signals and it can be impacted through um, immune dysregulation, it could be impacted through heavy metal toxicities, it could be impacted through chemical messengers, it's called cytokines, um, and blood sugar imbalances. And so when all of these things impact the, the pituitary, um, it's gonna s slow down processing. And we're gonna, I'm gonna erase all this stuff in a second and, and show you the mechanics of processing, but you gotta understand it's a processing problem. So what happens is, the pituitary, even though you know the, the functional ranges um, should be 1.8, uh, sorry, to 3.0, the lab ranges should be 0.4 to 4.5. So there's a lot, that's called the four standard deviation model. And so what that means is when you look at, um, let's look up here, when you look at a bell curve and, and you look at the first standard deviation, 68% of the population fall within that standard deviation. That's one standard deviation. Two standard deviations, 98% of the people fall in that standard deviation. So it's only 1% on the bottom and 1% on the high that fall in that outside of the range. So if you have two standard deviations on the low side and you have two standard deviations on the high side, that's considered a four standard deviation model. But when you have a two, one standard deviation on the low side and one standard deviation on the high side, that's considered a two standard deviation model. And, and typical Western medicine looks at a four standard deviation model where we're not gonna flag you until you're in the 1%. And guess what? Your body doesn't care about being in the 1% before it's going to be flagged. You're going to get tired. You're going to have brain fog. You're going to be cold. You're not going to be able to put on weight or lose weight, sorry. Um, you're not going to be able to have enough energy to get you through the day. You're going to be down and depressed. Your hair is not going to be um, strong and vibrant. It's going to be falling out. But guess what? You're not past that fourth standard deviation model, so you're told you're normal. So, so that's a, that's a big problem. And and when that when that when you look at um, your health that way, um, it, you're missing a lot of the people that um, are exhibiting symptoms before they get into that fourth standard deviation model. And and that's a huge huge problem. Um, looking at the the categories of dysfunction, so that's really what I wanted to talk to you about. So I'm actually going to erase up here, and I'm going to talk to you about how you should start thinking about um, thyroid problems. And we're going to call it the three P's. We're going to call it P1, P2, and P3. So P1 is going to be processing. And that's going to be how well do we make, <laughs> thanks, um, how well do we make um, the actual thyroid hormone? Um, do, we, do we get the proper signals? Are there anything that's impacting the processing? And this is where serotonin, um, people that are sort of the, 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 the guilty depressives, meaning people that you know, have a good life, um, you know, things are, think the good marriage, good job, good kids, but they're just 
you know, they're depressed and they feel, you know, guilty about it. I shouldn't feel this way. That's a serotonin problem. Um, or they're just not getting the same amount of contentment as they used to. Um, that's, that's a serotonin problem. Or a dopamine problem could be um, the people that don't have pleasures, they don't have motivation, they have inner rage, um, and um, those, are, those are a dopamine processing problem. And that's gonna impact the processing, in, in the processing of, of the hormone. But here's the thing, if you are not past the fourth standard deviation, and you're not below 0.45, you could be 5.0, or sorry, 0 0.50, you can be 1.2, you can be 1.4, you can be as high as 4, you know, 4.4 on the high end, and you're going to say that's not a processing problem. It's a huge problem. You're missing a lot of things. Um, other things can impact the processing, like inflammatory mechanisms, stress, and that's where adrenals overlap because now the, the pituitary is, is not getting the amount of signals that it should, and, and it's slightly low, like it's going to be lower than 1.8, and you're going to see it like 1.6, 1.4, and your doctor is going to say, well, you're not past that fourth standard deviation, um, you, um, you are normal, and, um, but yet your adrenal function is low, um, your, your hormone function is low, um, and your, your thyroid function is low. So there's a lot of things that can impact processing, and I know this is part two of thyroid, but we can really do part four, part eight, part 10, because there's so many different parts to it. Um, the next part I want to look at is the, um, oh, sorry, this, uh, this actually, I'm so sorry, this should be called production. So everything I just said, but call it production, my mistake. Is because I had a weekend where it was 20 hours, I had to drive to Tampa, it was another four hours, four hours back, and I got a little bit of brain fog and we're only on Tuesday. So the next part is the processing. So processing is where you're gonna see um, low T3 um, or free T3, and that's a conversion problem. 80% of the conversion takes place in the, in, the, in the liver and takes place in the, um, takes place in the gastrointestinal tract. So if we have microbial overgrowth, if we have um, um, H. pylori infection, if we have candida growth, if we have antibiotic residues, if we have leaky gut, if we have pathogenistic food that we eat, like we react to gluten, dairy, corn, eggs, soy, rice, potato, um, if you have a liver problem, you have um, uh, too much exposures to organophosphates, formaldehydes, um, you also have PCBs and plastics, and then you have dry cleaning, and you have fumigants, and it's, I hate to tell you, but that's going to impact your liver, and that's going to impact the processing uh, of, of, of the co converting of the thyroids. And, and then the last one is the proteomic effect, and this is really where... A lot of the genetics come into play where if someone has high homocysteine or low vitamin A or a methylation methylfolate problem uh, or a COMT problem, they are not repairing their cell membranes. And if you're not repairing your cell membranes, you're not getting hormone into the cell. And this is people that have insulin resistance, maybe cortisol resistance. Um, and there's something called homotropic uh, modul modulation, which means um, the more hormone you take, let's say you're taking a boatload of Synthroid, or you're taking a boatload of testosterone, or a boatload of um, uh, female hormones, you're going to bombard the cell, and it's going to impact the, in the proteomic effect of getting hormones into the cell, and yet your T4 was normal and your TSH was normal, and, and thyroids being missed. I mean, this is huge, huge problems, and this is really where we see adrenal fatigue as well, um, and because ultimately, all of these same things, um, the, the liver being congested from organophosphates and, and uh, chemicals and uh, pesticides and sprays um, and fumigants and 
parasites and bacterias and all of these things, these are the same things that are causing an inflammatory response that's slowing down the hypothalamus, that's slowing down the pituitary, that's impacting your adrenals. And then you wanna know, hey, what's the best way for me to fix my adrenals? What's the best supplement? And it's really mechanics. And that's why I have to tell you, I don't invest in, I was just telling someone this this morning, if someone says, I'm gonna, you know, we're raising money for Alzheimer's, we're, or we're, you know, we're trying to do cancer research, I really wish there was a miracle drug that would fix all of these things, but there's pathways. And until the specialists stop talking to, start talking to each other and stop doing their own little things, the body's gonna continue to act as a generalist. And, 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 and we really need to make sure that we're focusing on the mechanisms. And that's really what we're talking about is the mechanisms. Um, talking about MTHFR, so let's bring this over this way, you know, this way here. And let's look at, I don't know why it's so bright. It looks like it's, it's, there we go. All right. So I wanted to talk to you about what does MTHFR have to do with all of this? And MTHFR is right here. And one of the things that MTHFR does is when MTHFR is, is plus plus or plus minus, um, it's going to decrease the production of methylfolate, methyl tetrahydrofolate. And, and, and that's necessary for us to repair our cell membranes, repair our muscle, detoxify, make and break hormones, make and break neurotransmitters, repair your cells, make immune system work properly. I mean, it's important for everything. Um, but where does, what if you don't have an MTHFR? Uh, if you don't have an MTHFR, then you're fine, right? No, you're not. Because what happens is the thyroid is really responsible for making B2 into FAD. And it's dependent on T4. So T4, um, you know, on a lab range, 4.5 to 12 is the lab range. But from a healthy range, it's 6. So there's a difference. Like when you see someone that has a T4 that's less than 6, um, they're not going to be flagged on the lab ranges, not until it gets below 4.5. But um, they're, you know, let's say they're five or 5.2 or 4.8, then you know that whether or not you have an MTHFR problem, like plus plus or plus minus, you're not gonna be making FAD. And you're not gonna be making B2 riboflavin into FAD. As a result, you're gonna slow down MTHF production. And you'll slow, slow it down even more if you have a, uh, a low thyroid function. So now what does that mean? It means that you may not be able to get rid of a heavy metal. It may mean that you're not able to make biopterin to be able to make your neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin. And now you have this whole consequence of, well, if you're not making serotonin and dopamine, now all of a sudden you're slowing down that pituitary even further and now you have a production problem. And, and now it becomes this whole you know, negative spiral. Hopefully it's making sense to you because I know that it's very, very complicated stuff. So here's the, one of the takeaways, um, Steve, that I got from, the, um, from this is that doctors know all of this, but they don't want to get into it. And, and a lot of the times they just put their head in the sand and say, well, I, mean, I can't explain this to people. And what was really interesting was in this seminar, one of the doctors asked, the presenter, hey, what do you think is the best um, credentialing um, society out there right now in terms of um, you know, functional medicine? You know, is it the Institute of Functional Medicine? Is it the Functional Medicine University? Is it the A4M? Which one is it? And, um, and really, you know, one, some of the consensus was it was the Institute of Functional Medicine. And the Tis Karazian, well, you know, this is just hearsay, so I can't speak for if this is true or not, um, you know, ha, 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 can lecture for the Institute of Functional Medicine, but let the people know that, hey, you got to step your game up because what you're teaching um, your people is really, really basic, you know, first level stuff. And um, they said, well, we can't because we can't raise the game right now because this stuff is so complex. We don't want to blow the MDs out of the water. And so, you know, I, I went to a, um, a, a workshop not too long ago and it was talking about um, IgG and IgA testing, which is a sensitivity test. And when you do a skin fold test, it's an IgE test. It's an allergy. And there was a... Um, it was, you know, God bless him. He was, he's a fertility specialist 
um, and he was at this webinar or seminar and he raised his hand and he said, well, how can you tell if it's not an allergy? Um, like, I don't get like, you know, you're doing this blood test and it's like, I, I, you're not really asking that. I mean, that's 101. It, IgE is an allergy and they're, they just already said 20 times that they're measuring IgG and IgA. And so what happens is I do think that the medical society understands a lot of this stuff um, and chooses not to rock the boat, chooses not to be looked at as a pariah or someone that's outside of their, um, you know, their established standard of care. Um, and then insurance companies, and it's the same thing with, you know, you follow the money and that's who makes the rules. And unfortunately I got off topic there, but anyways, um, there's a lot of intricacies in here and it's really frustrating to see. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about was nutrients. So what nutrients would you suggest um, for someone the, um, who has a thyroid problem or who has an adrenal problem? When you gotta look at it in terms of stress and stress is um, depletion. So if, you know, that's where the adrenals fit in, where, you know, these whole cycles of spinning and making energy and detoxifying, think of it like the monkey who plays, you know, unfortunately, I don't even know what they were called, but they used to have the hand cranked uh, music boxes where the monkey would spin it. And that's how I think about stress and methylation. The more stressed you are, the more you're spinning it. The more you're spinning it, the more you're depleting things. The more you're depleting things, the more the gears are cranking and not spinning and breakdown happens. And that's when we stand up and we have a pot syndrome and we can't control our blood pressure and our heart rate. That's when we go to the beach and we can't cool off. That's when we can't, uh, our heart rate goes high or we can't fall asleep. That's when we just have basic physiological autonomic things that we take for granted and your body's not able to regulate that because there's a, 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 a ratio of not enough um, uh, supply with the demand and then you have the expression of an autoimmunity or you have um, you know a, a Epstein-Barr virus reactivate or you have a shingles or herpes cold sore that comes out or you go through mild depression to huge anxieties Hopefully that makes a lot of sense to you guys and that's how they're really related where stress um, impacts the same um, production, processing and proteomic level of both the thyroid and the adrenals and, and you really have to look at what you're doing on a day to day basis from handling your glucose levels to um, eating healthy foods to being able to get nutritional foods to being able to make sure that you're digesting them to make sure that there's um, not chemicals or antibiotics or GMOs in those foods, um, making sure that you know you're taking time to smell the roses and, and breathing and not eating on the go and you're in a loving relationship. That was one of the really important things which I'll do in you know adrenal fatigue and thyroid disorders part three is we'll talk about um, the things that can slow down the autoimmune pathway. And one of the things that can is high intensity interval training. Now that's a catch 22, how can I go and do high interval intensity training when I'm exhausted and I have no energy. Um, but we're not asking you to do it like intensely. We're asking you maybe three to five minutes in the morning. You do 30 seconds on, a minute off, 30 seconds on, a minute off, 30 seconds on, a minute off. And what's that? That's 30 seconds plus one, one and a half. 30 seconds plus one, that's three. 30 seconds plus one, that's four and a half minutes. And really only one minute and a half of of, and when I say intense, maybe you're doing, you know, sitting, you know, squatting, or you're doing jumping jacks, and then really that will help with um, getting cytokines to be settled down a little bit. Um, the other thing we look at is um, being in loving relationships and meaningful relationships. Those will settle down cytokine production as well, and that's really, really important um, for being able to slow down the um, the autoimmune pathway, um, and that's what the relationship between adrenal fatigue and, and stress and thyroid is. So I know I rambled through that very, very quickly. Um, I don't think there was anything else that I had anticipated talking about today, um, but if there's any questions, I would love to answer them for you. Let me go back to the top here and see what we say, nice haircut, growing your winter beard, um, doing a great job, keep it up, thanks buddy, I hope you do well in your Berkey race this weekend, um, and, and I love, I wanna see the icicles come off your beard, and, uh, and then maybe one of these days we'll meet and, uh, and grab a seminar together. 
Uh, hey Robin, can EBV mess uh, big time with your thyroid um, if it uh, has been reactivated? Absolutely. That's one of the things we talked about is, you know, IgG, um, IgM, and IgA. So IgM is considered, you know, an active um, infection in the classical endocrinological, endocrine, endocrinological, is that the way you say it? Uh, um, uh, um, school of, of thought. And zero to three months, it's an active infection. And then after it's negative, then you, you know, you see an IgG past infection. Um, but it doesn't work that way anymore. Um, and it's not classical. And just like we figured out that the world isn't flat, um, you know, and that we don't play music through an eight track tape anymore, um, you know, life goes on. And, and we learn that there's different ways to explain our realities. And one of the ways is, is that you can have an IgM infection lay dormant for years and years and years, and then it reactivates. And you can have an IgG that if it's three times the level of normal, it's a reactivation. So number one, I know that doesn't answer your question, Robin, um, but a lot of people that I see, and I'm sure a lot of people that um, are doctors that uh, see other people, um, see these obnoxious levels of EBV or cytomegalovirus or whatever viruses you see, and the doctor says, oh, don't worry, it's a past infection, it's an IgG, raise your hand or put likes or um, put hearts or question, you know, um, um, whatever, whatever they are, the blue things, I don't even thumbs up. If you um, if you had that happen to you, where oh the doctor said it's a past infection, I don't need to worry about it. Well, hold your horses. What's happening is that's causing a cytokine reaction. That's causing a depletion of your antioxidant reserves. That's causing a breakdown of your gut lining, your brain lining, your heart lining. That's causing an imbalance between your immune system, and that's stimulating a, a, an autoimmune response. And, and all because it was a past exposure that is not to be worried about. So I don't accept that. And yes, I hope that answers your question. It can definitely impact this whole processing. It impacts all, all peas. It impacts the production, it impacts the processing, and it impacts the proteomic level. It impacts all the levels. And, and TSH and T4 is not gonna fix that by looking at those values only. Um, my applied kinesiologist cured my EBV. Good stuff. I mean, I wish I can, you know, muscle test pathways and, and fix it in, in one muscle test. I just, I, I'm not that good, unfortunately. Um, also read never an outbreak again. Good. Um, Tammy, how do we stop the EBV virus from reactivating? Um, you know, it really comes down to common sense in terms of um, controlling, you know, the, all levels of production, processing, and um, and the proteomic getting it into the cell. So what does that mean? That means the immune system has to be working well. We have to have good um, balancing of our glucose levels. We have to keep a very healthy barrier system in the lungs and the brain and the, and the gut. We have to make sure that we um, count our blessings and we have to make sure that um, we're grateful and we have to make sure that we um, have a good vibration working. And I think that's really important. Um, we have to make sure we drink healthy water breathe healthy air, eat healthy foods. We have to make sure that we understand our genetic weak links and what our problems are. And uh, easier said than done, but you know, or you can just go to the other girl's uh, kinesiologist and he can muscle test you and you're fixed. Um, anyways, where did my questions go? All right. Um, Allison, I, I recently tested low iron and my reverse T3 is high at 24. Um, I know iron affects thyroid and iron uh, and high iron is as bad as low iron and I don't want to overdo it to supplements. What do you recommend? It's a great question. Um, so, um, you know, I would be looking at an absorption issue. Um, so you're probably not secreting enough hydrochloric acid to liberate iron um, from the um, from the food that you're getting um, or there sometimes could be an iron overload from synthetic white death is what we call it. So, you know, gluten, um, anything that's enriched, um, you know, they used to have a video, actually we've been wanting to do this video where you put cornflakes in a blender 
and, and then you put a magnet on the outside of the blender and then you see all these flakes you know stick to the side and that's because there's these little iron enriched filaments in the foods and we get a lot of iron loans so that's the real concern when there's an adrenal problem there's usually a copper metabolism problem um, there's usually iron deficiencies or there's cr usually they that's not to be confused with an, um, a, a chronic um, anemia um, and that will cause um, a, 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 um, a iron metabolism issue um, so so you have to kind of understand that 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 sort of whole process but I would say to you don't overthink it um, obviously if your t3 is really high something stressful in the body and that could be low iron it could be an absorption issue um, I would be looking at natural forms of iron I've mentioned it many times I don't like synthetic stuff I'd be looking at I like a, a supplement called erythro pro and that's from PRL and that's a natural occurring iron um, and um, and then absorbing your, your nutrients and trying to get some some really good iron out of your food um, and, and really trying to settle down your inflammation that's the way I'd be looking at it and I wouldn't sort of micromanage and balance your I don't do that I know a lot of hair mineral analysis specialists do some really great balancing stuff and I never went down that rabbit hole and so um, I did but then I came back out and went down the genetic rabbit hole and so um, maybe at some point I'll go down more of the rabbit hole with hair mineral analysis um, but what I didn't like about it was they recommended their supplements that had all these crappy synthetic stuff which they're preaching about iron metabolism because of synthetic stuff and it's like well I'm not gonna be you know, going to whatever I'm, I don't want to go more into that um, tag to rewatch hi Joel you're sounding so smart tonight <laughs> just tonight thank you for your wisdom you're welcome Tracy um, me at the moment. Sorry to hear that, Robin. Tracy, I, uh, I want to work with you. I'm about to go to a functional medicine doctor in April, but I truly feel in my heart you are the one to help me. Okay, well, what we do is we do a free 45-minute um, no-obligation consultation to get down to the truth of what's not working, um, where you are with your health, where you want to be, and we really look at two major things. We look at the environmental component, and we look at the genetic component, and we see what information are you using in regards to that and what's really interesting is I I've done hundreds of these calls and my oblig my goal is just to get to the truth and um, I, I find that people kind of sit on the other side with their arms crossed and they they're they're very you know they're they've they've gone through a lot of hassles they've gone through trials and tribulations and they're very skeptical and they have a lot of um, they have a lot of uh, obstacles or or sort of things between them to communicate with them um, and ultimately I've tried everything and what are you gonna do that's different and I'm like well let's talk about what you've tried and and then we start going down the list and I was like well what did the genetic test say well I didn't do that okay All right that's one thing you can do what did the the organic acid test say well I didn't do that either okay and not to say doc a lot of doctors do that um, alright so what did you know what's your glucose levels well, I didn't do that either. All right, well, how many calories are you eating a day? I don't do that either. What about carbs? How many carbs do you take per day? I don't know. What's your pH levels or how much inflammation do you have in your body? Well, my, P, my, blood, tests, my blood tests are normal. My CRP and my ESR, they're all normal. And, and so, um, but I've done all the supplements and I, well, you haven't done a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff you haven't done. And, and you know, a lot of the times we'll say, you know, water doesn't boil at a hundred degree at 99 degrees. It, it doesn't boil at 98. You can be really, really close. Um, but it's that 1% to 3% difference that is going to make the 97 to 98% improvement, Tracy. So um, what I'll do is I'll put the link in that um, and that's for anyone. But I always say this. Don't sign up um, if you're not serious about getting better um, and, and you're just sort of kicking tires and you're wanting to sort of pick my brain in terms of what's the best supplement you should be using or can I review your blood test. Um, it's not really about that. It's about really getting down to the truth and figuring out how painful is it to sit in this crappy life that you're living in and what are you willing to do to get out of it. And, and I really think if that's the case, then we can maybe put the plan together. Hopefully that made sense. Joel, does going into keto stress the adrenals? That's a great question, Deb. I've wanted to do that. A lot of videos on that. I give you guys votes on, hey, here's the different topics that I want you to do and, and that I want to talk about. And ultimately, it doesn't get picked. And I've done a lot of that. And I, the answer I would say is it depends. 
That's the best answer I would give you. It really depends on a lot of things because number one, it, it depends on if you're doing it right. A lot of people aren't doing it right. What you think is keto and what I think is keto are two different things. Um, number two, are you actually being accountable? Are you knowing what your actual grams of carbs, proteins, and fats are? Are you willing to look at that? Um, um, uh, is there any major stressors or genetic predispositions for not doing that properly? What's the gut health like? Is there major candida growth? Is there a lot of bacteria considerations? Um, you know, um, is there gallbladder? How's the methylation looking like? Um, a lot of things. So I would say yes, no, or maybe. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Teresa, thank you so much for sharing your vast knowledge. You're very, very welcome. I see you giving me a lot of high fives and thumbs up and thank you for being part of this group. That's why I don't go to doctors. Well, don't, you know, you still got to go to doctors. Like, let me just preface, Robin, that I'm from a traditionally medically trained family and I'm the weirdo black sheep. And, and I always was sort of like scratching my head. Well, why, why do we got to do that when we can do this? And, you know, my story is I had adrenal fatigue. I had an exercise physiology background. I was a trainer. I have certified strength and conditioning specialist. And they wanted me to do surgery when I injured my back or go through physical therapy. And it's like, I, I know more than the physical therapist already. And why would I go for s surgery? So, you know, sometimes like I talked to a guy today and he came in to see my office and he has one kidney. And I asked him why they took his kidney out. And it's like, well, they saw a mass on it. It was in the early 70s and that's what they did. And so, you know, I guess I would say is when you get a major diagnosis, unfortunately, cancer is this big billion dollar industry that steamrolls you. And you need to just sort of take a sidestep, take a deep breath and understand really what's going wrong and try to get to the bottom of what makes sense to you the most. But you still need doctors. Don't get me wrong. Doctors um, do a great job when it comes to acute stuff. And, and they do care. They got into the business in the first place because they care. Um, it's just the dogmatic, um, holier-than-thou violation of the Hippocratic Oath of not doing any harm by um, errors of commission and omission that, that um, think their crap doesn't stink and, and judges you for being crazy, depressed, anxious, um, a slob, um, not, you know, not showing any discipline, eating, um, you know, cupcakes and bonbons, and that's why you're, you know, the way you are. And they need to have a better bedside manner, and they have to really come from the heart and care about. Um, so, and I think there's a lot of doctors that do that, but they lack integrity when they don't. Um, because they are holier than thou and they, they do as they, they don't do as they say. Um, and that's hypocritical in my book. Anyways, infrared uh, light therapy directly over the kidneys, does that help? Yeah, I really like those devices, Melissa. They are the, um, I have one here. Um, I need to buy a new one because it's, it's been gone through a lot of wear and tear. Um, but is these infrared devices, they're called, um, they're like little wraps that have little, um, little infrared uh, on there and it's great I do it every morning now um, I think I'm dealing with a parasite infection don't tell anyone um, but um, because that's a HIPAA violation and so um, anyways um, I put that with the castor oil pack you can do that over the kidneys you can do that over the adrenals you can do that over probably even the thyroid um, and you can really get some really great uh, impact from that what water do you recommend um, you know usually distilled um, you know, uh, distilled water. I don't like the reverse osmosis because it takes a lot of those minerals out. Um, filtered, distilled. Um, the guy from PRL, Dr. Marshall, rest in peace, he used to do a, a really strong powered filtration system and then he would distill his filtered water. And um, I'm not there yet, but maybe one day um, I'll do that. Infections cause blood pressure to bottom completely out. Emergency s situation every time. I keep uh, the health, I keep health in check. Okay, I don't, I don't really get that. Infection causes uh, blood pressure to bottom out completely. Emergency situation every time. I don't, I don't know what you're trying to say, Kelly. I'm sorry, maybe you can clarify that. Ozone therapy. Dr. Joel, is it possible to heal my thyroid mostly with good iodine supplementation? My last test was 8.3 and that was without taking my nat nature thyroid for two months as I was out of the prescription. I feel good without it. Okay, so is, is it possible that I healed my thyroid mostly with good iodine supplementation? My last test was 8.3. Are you talking about T4, I think? Your total T4? Um, because you're not talking about TSH. Um, well, you know, 
again, Dana, I would want to know, you know, what's actually happening at the proteomic level, and that's really free T3 over reverse T3. So, um, but, you know, you go by symptoms, you go by how you feel. And so, yes, it is possible if, you know, the main mechanism was uh, an iodine depletion. But, you know, there, it's, it's very reductionistic to say that's the only thing that's going wrong. And, um, you know, but, you know, kudos. You could. I, I would say you could. Rob, and me too. I'm in such bad reception here in Australia for the call. I'm sorry. Unable to watch. Not sure why, but it's prompting me to open app in Google Play. I have my iPhone and Facebook already installed. I can see the post and comments, but I won't open it live event. Yes, there will definitely be a replay, Jamie. Um, I'll tag your name on there. And that's it for today, really. Um, I hope that was helpful. If there's any other questions, let me know now. Um, I will do a part three on this. I'll probably do a part four on this, probably do a part five, and maybe even a part six. It's like the Fast and the Furious. And I've never watched one of those, and I just don't know how you know people how it's made millions of dollars i mean i don't get it and it's like the seventh one out you know but this this should make millions of dollars and and there's going to be 10 of them out so anyways hopefully that was helpful i'm glad i was actually smart today tracy um that makes me happy to know that um but usually i i spit out good wisdom every time and that's why I'm the Adrenal Fatigue Recovery Ninja. So anyways, um, that's all I got to say for you guys today. Um, hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, hopefully you found it very valuable. Um, once again, I'll put a link to uh, doing the 45-minute consults. Um, and, um, and again, my name is Dr. Joel Rosen. I am the Adrenal Fatigue Recovery Ninja. And I look forward to helping you with your, your adrenal fatigue nightmare. And you're very welcome, Gail. Um, I hope that was very, very helpful. Thank you. Bye.